Hi, welcome back to the Rod Chapel Show. Thanks for joining us. Today we've got a great guest and I think you're really going to enjoy some of the content that you'll hear today. Art Hernandez is here to join us and we're going to talk about immigration law in Missouri and some of the real issues that touch on it. Art, thanks for coming to the show. Thank you for having me, Rod. Absolutely. Well, can you tell our, our viewers a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I grew up in Texas. I uh, went to school in Texas. Uh, decided that I wanted to experience what the rest of the world had to offer, so I went to law school in New England. Went to live there for a number of years. Uh huh. That um, must have been a big change. It, the winters actually exist in New England. <laughs> they don't exist in Texas, uh, or at least in South Texas, in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And then um, I met my wife in law school in in Vermont, mm -hmm. and we she's from Missouri, mm -hmm. and we moved down here and. I worked for the state public defender's office for about five and a half years, uh, and then I left and opened my own practice, and I've been in practice for myself for about five years now. Okay. It'll actually be five years December 1st. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, our focus is, is immigration law, mm -hmm. criminal law, family law, and, uh, and my wife is an attorney. She works uh, of counsel with us, mm -hmm. and her, fa her focus is environmental and utility law. Wow, wow. Those are uh, a, a number of different areas, and you know, uh, we've kind of talked on this show before about how when you're uh, looking at a different area of law, you probably want to get somebody that actually practices in that area, right? Um, well, well, tell us, what, uh, I have had people call and ask questions about their status, and I've been practicing law for a while now, let's put it like that, and, and don't have a great sense of how vast immigration law is. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the immigration issues that you handle and ones that uh, you see coming up mostly? Sure. Um, I mean, in reality, immigration law is vast. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, is a federal, it is a federal beast. Uh -huh. uh, it it er derives from the Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it is primarily an Im a federal uh, issue. Mm -hmm. So the, the laws themselves have to be uh, tailored to fit all 50 states plus the territories of the United States. Okay. So the issues that are specific to Missouri are important, mm -hmm. but they're not any less important than the issues, for example, in Texas or in Massachusetts or in Washington. Gotcha. The, 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 the laws have to be tailored to fit all of the U.S. Mm -hmm. It has to fit the southern border, which there tends to be a big hot topic issue right. about. Right. Uh, but it also has to fit the, the, the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, the, the, there's a large immigrant crisis in Europe right. uh, that is coming out of the Syrian conflict. But that's going to affect us, and it, it is actually affecting us now. Uh, and those issues are going to be with us today. They were with us last year. They were with us years ago, mm -hmm. and they're going to be with us in the future. Wow. You, sometimes when I think about immigration, uh, you know, I've, I've had a chance to go to New York and see uh, Ellis Island, right? I mean, that, that's, that was part of the system, right? Yeah, Ellis Island was part of the system. It was the largest area where immigrants from Europe came in. Mm -hmm. Uh, but San Francisco was the largest area for Chinese and, and uh, Asian Pacific immigrants for the longest time. Uh. Um, a number of large cities in, in, in the south, San Antonio, Houston, Phoenix, Los Angeles, those were areas of immigrant uh, activity from the southern borders. Uh, nowadays, every airport is an immigrant hub <laughs> because every airport or in a national airport at least, mm -hmm. accepts flights from other countries. Uh -huh. Those people have to be processed through. Now, if you fly from a country to the United States or you fly out of the U.S. to another country mm -hmm. for, for vacation, right. everyone fills out that little yellow sheet mm -hmm. that, that you get in the, in the plane. It's called an I-94. Okay. That is not a visa. That is a document that says, this is who I am, this is my dates of travel, and this is the purpose of my travel. On that I-94 document, we'll have a return date mm -hmm. or a date that 
if you're coming to the U.S., a date that you should that you have to leave by. Ah. That does not grant you any other status other than this is the time you have to leave. Oh, okay. So th that is a document. Mm -hmm. That th there's a it's a travel document. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between the travel document and what is considered a visa. Okay. There are, there are a number of types of different visas. Okay. Uh, visas are the actual status, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that you acquire from the U.S. government. Okay. Um, there are a number of visas. For example, uh, the B-1, B-2 visas, which are the visitor visas, the vacation visas. Oh. If you have a family member who lives outside of the United States, mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you have a family member from Jamaica, mm -hmm. I have a number of, of clients who, who have Jamaican family members or family members from Canada. Right. They come to the U.S. For, to visit. Mm -hmm. They're here on a B-1 or B-2 visa. Okay. That visa may be for 10 years. But it's, it's, it's no different than your passport. A U.S. passport is valid for 10 years. Okay. After 10 years, you have to renew your passport. Right. What a visa is, is basically a passport for a foreign national. Okay. But it's not a passport. Mm -hmm. it, it, but there's a similar, it's a similar uh, renewal process. Process, okay. So what the, the visa does, it confers a specific type of status that you're in. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, as exa for example, the B-1, B-2 visas. You could have an H visa, which is a worker's visa. Okay. Uh, those are temp usually uh, temporary visas. Mm -hmm. So you're only allowed to be in the U.S. for a certain number of years. Okay. Uh, your F visas for your Lincoln students or mm -hmm. for the students who are watching. Uh -huh. The F visa is a student visa. Okay. Uh, you are entitled to come to school. Mm -hmm. Not any school that you want to go to. You have to be accepted into a U.S. program mm -hmm. before you apply to the F visa. Oh, and, and you have to stick with that and program? And you have to stay in that program. Okay. You can't transfer from Lincoln to Mizzou without approval from the U.S. immigration system. Wow. Okay. Okay. If you do, you're out of status. Mm -hmm. And if you're out of status, you can be removed. In the old days, it was called de deportation. Right. But now we call it removal. Is so you could be ineligible mm -hmm. or, or in removal status. And the difference between those two is ineligible means you're not allowed to come into the U.S. Mm -hmm. Removal means you have to be removed. You're going to be removed from the U.S. And so, like, if uh, removal, if, for example, somebody figured out that you were out of status, maybe law enforcement, they may actually, actually take you right then? Or how does that they, work? They can. Okay. I mean, the reality is... is Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, ICE, uh -huh. which is the, the law the law program, the, the law enforcement arm of, of the immigration system, uh -huh. they are the ones uh, who will do the arresting and, and the, the process. Okay. Um, it's, it's not that common for ICE to come in if you're, if you're a student and you transferred, or if you're a worker mm -hmm. and, you, and you transfer jobs right. without approval from USCIS, mm -hmm. then uh, you will n you're out of status okay. at that point, and you could be removed. Okay. doesn't mean you're automatically removed. There's a giant process that has to happen. You are entitled. So the due process rights of an immigrant are different from a U.S. citizen mm -hmm. in some specific aspects, such as right to counsel and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But as far as removal proceedings, you still have, you're still entitled to a hearing. Okay. You're still entitled to be in front of a judge, an immigration judge, okay. who would determine whether you actually violated an immigration law and whether you sh what the punishment for that violation should be. Gotcha, gotcha, and uh, okay, and so there's a 994 that we would take, just travel documents, right? There are visas that people can get to come to the United States. Sometimes Correct. they're for different lengths of time, depending on what they're going to do. Um, let, let's touch back just a little bit on the on the framework that this whole system operates on. Okay. So it's a federal system that's got special, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, rules for each state is that right uh, it, no the, okay. it, the, there are special rules for the immigration courts I see there, okay there is in, in the federal system there is the US district courts mm -hmm. the appellate courts and the Supreme Court right in the district courts each district court has 
specialized courts to attach to it. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court, well, actually what it is, is the Supreme Court has a specialized court system. Okay. And that's called the, the immigration courts. The, immigra the EOIR, which is the uh, uh, Executive Office Immigration Review. Hmm. So it's a, it's a mixed, it's an, an administrative court. Okay. So it's a mixture of executive office and judicial office branches. Uh, there are, the first level would be uh, generally is USCIS, which mm -hmm. is kind of the administrative office. Mm -hmm. The judge, the judgeship on the first level is considered the immigration judge, the IJ. Okay. Then you have uh, there's two branches. There's the Executive Office of Immigration Review, mm -hmm. which is kind of a civil appellate review board. Mm -hmm. Or you could go with the Board of Immigration Appeals, okay. which is an appellate court under the immigration courts. And then from that, if, then, then the next step would be the district courts and then appellate courts and then the U.S. Supreme Court, if it gets to that. Wow. Wow. That sounds like quite a system. It's complicated. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, there's no simple answer. For anyone to say that they have a simple answer to the immigration solution, mm -hmm. I, would, I would like to see a simple answer. Right. But the problem is, is these are human beings and people that we're talking about. Right. And nothing is ever simple about human beings or people. <laughs> no matter where they're from. No matter where they're from, no matter where the age is. It, right. We're talking about children all the way up to, to the elderly. Wow. Wow. And so, can, can, do you see people trying to represent themselves through this process? Unfortunately, all the time. Yeah. Like I said before, un unfortunately, one of the due process rights that U.S. citizens are guaranteed is the right to counsel. Mm -hmm. Right to counsel does not apply to non-immigrant or to, to non-U.S. citizens okay, uh, in the immigration courts. Okay. So, um, for example, earlier this year, there was a, a large media storm about uh, this influx of children, mm -hmm. undocumented and un, uh, oh, sure. unassisted children coming mm -hmm. into the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really, really a, a rough situation in, in the southern states. Most of these children are coming from Central America okay. and South America. Hmm. They are going through, these are children from the ages of 5 to 12, 13 years old who are unaccompanied, traveling from Venezuela, Guatemala, Costa Rica, all the way up through Mexico into the southern United States. Good grief. They come to the U.S., they get arrested, they get placed in detention centers, mm -hmm. U.S., which would be considered U.S. prisons. Oh. Uh, they're, they're large bays with, with bunk beds. Um, they get rudimentary health care, um, vaccinations and stuff like that to prevent disease outbreak and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they're presented before a judge, oftentimes without counsel, unless there's volunteers. There are, there are a number of, of volunteers who do really great work, just pro bono, representing these, these children and these young adults uh, to prevent the government from basically putting them on a bus driving them to the other side of the border and opening the doors, letting them out and saying good luck. And when you say the other side of the border, so if we've got someone here who's say from Venezuela, but they wouldn't go back to Venezuela, they may end up in Mexico or somebody, sure. someplace else? They, Canada, Mexico, wherever. Might not even speak the language. Nope. Now the process is that they, they do try to, to place them back. Right. But there's a, I know a number of stories and they're like every other newscast that you hear. I right. mean, there's some truth to it, some, some tall tales to it. Mm -hmm. But there are a number of, of children, a number of young adults, a number of uh, a, a large other, another large population affected is, is single mothers with young children okay. who don't speak the language, uh -huh. uh, who don't know the customs. Mm -hmm. uh, they're here with, with their children. And they're escaping war. They're escaping the drug war in right. Central America and in, in Mexico and North in South America. Mm -hmm. uh, they're ex I have a number of, of clients who are f escaping uh, civil wars in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a large population of, of Asian Americans in Central America, in Central Missouri, mm -hmm. that uh, that are escaping just 
conditions that aren't that we would as American citizens would consider not necessarily appalling in some cases appalling yeah but in, in most cases just uncomfortable mm -hmm. sure um, and these people, majority of them, are looking just for a better life. Right. I mean, and does that usually start with safety as being one of the key concerns and then range from there to an economic survival? I, I think those are all tied in, it, in into one bundle. You can't piece and parcel. Like I said, humans are, are a complex group. Right. Uh, I may be hungry, but there may be something underlying that hunger. Uh -huh. uh, poverty. Right. Uh, abuse. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Education. Mm -hmm. These are all issues that may be lacking in some in some areas, stronger in, in others, but they all lead to one simple fact. The fact of the matter is, those people are wanting to come to the United States mm -hmm. for a better life. Wow. Um, you know, statistics are, and I have some statistics here that, yeah. that I just printed out mm -hmm. um, in regards to to. Uh, a common argument about immigration that, that immigrants are, are not paying their fair share, right. they're not pulling. You uh, hear that all the time. You hear that all the time. And, and there was a, there's a, uh, an article and it talks about, uh, and the latest numbers were from uh, 2012, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, undocumented immigrants paid $11.84 billion in state and local taxes in 2012. You never hear about that. You don't hear about that. Right. Uh, that, uh, I mean, the, the general study is that, um, <coughs> excuse me. Mm -hmm. You said uh, over $11 billion in state? Well, $11 billion. That was in, just in 2012. One year, um, okay. There was a, there is a number that the U.S., um, excuse me. Mm -hmm. that, that Missouri, that, that's, this is the issue, for Missouri citizens, uh, that the, uh, the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy reported that unauthorized immigrants in Missouri paid $44 million in state and local taxes in 2010, right. $8.3 million in state income taxes, and $31.7 million in sales taxes, and $4.1 million in property taxes. And that was just in 2010 alone. Wow. And the, the, the studies conclude throughout the United States that on average, the, the undocumented immigrants pull their own weight in taxes. Mm -hmm. do, they gen do they pay employment tax? Generally, no. Most of them do not work. They work under the table right? for whatever reasons, mm -hmm. uh, fear. Uh, I get a number of people who call me, mm -hmm. ask for advice. They don't want to give me their name. They don't want to give me their phone number, but they ask if they can come in. Wow. It is a general fear, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is they pay their taxes, they pay their fair share, uh, they're, not living on, they're not living and skimming off the radar. Mm -hmm. they don't, they're not eligible for Medicaid, they're not eligible for Medicare, right. they're not eligible for welfare benefits, because if they don't have social security numbers or addresses or uh -huh. birth certificates, you can't get them. Right. Under federal law, you're not entitled to them. There are just as, just as many people who are not eligible for those benefits who are U.S. citizens who scam the system mm -hmm. as there are undocumented immigrants who scam the system. Good grief. The difference is, is not that illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants are, not, are doing it more. Uh -huh. It's that it's an easy, it's not, it's not me, it's them. Right. And it's easy to say they're the bad guy. Right. I'm not the bad guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess that's a huge issue, too. I mean, just the perception, you know, uh, the media is all over any kind of immigrant, as if that's uh, not what America's made of. We're all immigrants. Yeah. Even, I mean, if, if you, if you want to go back and, and say that, that the Native Americans who are here, uh, you, can, you can say that, you know, if, if you believe the anthropological data, mm -hmm. They immigrated to the, to the, to the Americas 12,000 years ago. Right. Uh, we're all immigrants. Mm. We're all different. Right. Nobody's the same. Yeah. Nobody's different. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just human beings. Right. And we're all looking for, we all either have children or family members yeah. or loved ones 
And, and that's why I do what I do. It, it, it's a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. It's about loving your neighbor as yourself. Right. I wouldn't want to treat anybody who has a mom or dad any different than I would want anybody to treat my mom or dad. Amen. Yeah. 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 That's huge, Art. That's huge. It's just how I feel. Amen. Man. Well, and if you were, if a person is in this system, though, and you're caught up and you've made it to America uh, or the United States or one of its territories, I guess, right, uh, then you can actually get a visa or you can get what's also known, I think we, it's the, the green card. Uh, what's the official name for that these days? LPR, Legal Permanent Residency Card. But even whatever piece of paper you have, it doesn't give you the same rights as a citizen. Is that right? That is correct. Um, an LPR is a permission to remain in the United States permanently. Mm -hmm. But it does not grant you citizenship status. You have to apply to become a citizen. But in order to become a citizen, you have to, if you're not born here and naturalized, right. uh, you have to go through the naturalization process. Uh -huh. And part of that process is to become an LPR stat, an LPR first. Okay. Uh, the way it works out is there are two types of, uh, there's two major categories of becoming a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there are three other categories, but the first, the primary one is family-based immigration. Mm -hmm. Second is employment-based immigration. Okay. Then you have your refugees or asylee status. Uh, right. There's a diversity lottery program, huh. which is a, a very specialized program. Uh, for certain people who are born, who live in certain countries okay. uh, that are friendly to the United States. And the, the fifth program is, a, is adoption through naturalization. Okay. Uh, but but the, big one, the big one that I deal with here in, in mid-Missouri is the family-based and the employment-based. Gotcha. Um, most of those are spouses of either LPRs or... U.S. citizens, mm -hmm. children of U.S. citizens or, or LPRs okay. uh, who are coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, you have to fill out a number of documents, pay the USCIS fee. Is that high, by the way? Uh, for spouses who, if you're a U.S. citizen or an LPR who is sponsoring a, a foreign national to become come to the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, there are two main forms. There are a number of additional forms that you have to file, but the two main forms are the I-485, mm -hmm. which is the petition for alien relative, okay. and the I-130, which is, well, the I-130 is the petition for alien, it's the U.S. citizen petitioning for the alien relative to come to U.S., okay. and the I-485 is the alien, is the request to come to the U.S. I see. So okay. it takes those two So it takes those two together. Mm -hmm. Those filing fees total on those two forms uh, almost almost fifteen hundred dollars and those are fees that only go to the u.s that's not a fee that a private attorney would, f that would right you. to actually fill those out in a way that gets Correct. them through the process that those are just the fees that you pay the u.s government for them to process your paperwork good grief along with the copies of your passport your medical records your proof that you've been married it it i mean it's a substantial packet i mean yeah. our packets are are, are fairly hefty mm-hmm and then there's the U.S. postage included <laughs> right, as well. Right, uh, right. But those, those, you know, we do those on a, on a regular basis. How long do you think it would take a person to get through that process, or would you expect in general? Uh, normally what I tell people is currently with the spouse petitions, you're looking at about six to eight months okay. for the petition to get through and be finalized. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that process right now is um, we file the petition, pay the filing fee. Mm -hmm. you, there's a number of other documents that you can file along. Request for work authorization okay. is one mm -hmm. so that your alien relative can, can work while they're waiting for the U.S. or for the petition to go through. Can they actually uh, be here while they're doing that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If they're allowed, to, if they're here legally, mm -hmm. if they're here in status, ah. then they can apply while they're in status. Gotcha. That now, goes if they're outside of the U.S. and they're not here legally, mm -hmm then they can apply, but they, that process is called counselor process because it goes through the U, U.S. consulate's office mm -hmm. in the country that they live in. Gotcha. So um, 
there's a number of things that we file. Uh, we usually get a receipt within a couple, two weeks or so from our filing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it just kind of varies. They will have to normally, uh, they have to uh, apply for what's called biometrics, mm -hmm. which is a fingerprinting program okay. that they have to go through, specialized through USCIS. Mm -hmm. uh, and then normally they have a, an in-person interview uh, at the USCIS office in Kansas City, which is the area for here. Okay. Uh, and they, they sit down, and it's usually a 15, 20 minute interview. And what mm -hmm. the counselor, what the, uh, you're in an interview with the USCIS officer, the US Customs and Immigration Systems officer. Okay. Uh, and they're really kind of just checking for marriage fraud and see if, if you really know the person that you, that is sponsoring you. Right. Uh, but the onus is always on the petitioner. It's not really on the person on the on the foreign uh, national. Oh, interesting. Because the petitioner is is the U.S. citizen who's actually asking for the permission mm -hmm. for this person to come. And, and can they have a lawyer accompany them through that process? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's not rec they don't get one as a matter of right, like in a criminal proceeding. Correct. But you can have one if you can afford Correct. it. Right. That, and that's something we do on a regular basis. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I know that there are a ton of other aspects of of immigration law. Some of the other things that I was hoping we might be able to talk about, and if not today, maybe another day, uh, were the criminal law implications, right? Sure. Say you're here with a visa, what happens if you get accused of a crime? Uh, or I guess uh, with an LPR. Uh, it seems like that would be a very interesting thing that we probably ought to talk about. And then there's a the whole educational aspect, right? You know, some of the backlash that we've seen behind immigration reform uh, seems to be really human exclusion from some of the systems like education and health care. Uh, I, I gather that there's, that there's some implications for immigration on those areas as well. In Missouri, that, that is really the hot topic, education for, uh, for DREAMers or, or DACA students. Right. Um, there, there's an attempt to, to by the, well, the ACLU currently has filed a, a, a lawsuit against Missouri education system mm -hmm. uh, claiming that the, they're charging a, a different tuition for s certain foreign national students than they are regular students, even though those foreign nationals live in, this, live in Missouri. Right. They're not charging them in-state tuition, they're charging them international tuition because they fall in a specific category. Good grief. Good grief. And I guess that's one of the things we'll be seeing in the news coming up. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's in the news now. Uh, I think the ACLU filed something last week. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been out there, and we'll be hearing more about it fairly soon. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us on the Rod Chapel Show. It's been a real pleasure having Art Hernandez here answering some fundamental issues about what it is to be a citizen, what it is to be an American, and the process to get there. Art, thanks for coming. I hope we have you again. Thank you, Rod. Thank I you. Appreciate it.